an associate faculty member in the Divinity School and an associate faculty member at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. He is also a co-chair of the Human Rights Program at the University of Chicago. Professor Bud Rudney writes and teaches in political philosophy, philosophy and literature, bioethics, and philosophy of religion. Today, the title of his talk is Clinician or Collective Action Cop. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. It's, it, it's great to be here. Um, thank you, Mark, for asking me. I don't have any slides because I am a political philosopher and we just read papers. We're back in the 20th century. Um, I was a little puzzled what a political philosopher would have to talk about when Mark asked me to be on this panel. Um, but um, I think there's a way that political philosophy can, uh, can get in here. So pediatricians sometimes deal with, parent, with parents who refuse to permit their child to be vaccinated. So in this paper, I'm not going to attempt to help the pediatrician decide what to do. Philosophy is really not as much of a practical discipline as I sometimes would like it to be. But I want to reflect on the pediatrician's predicament and what it shows about the social role, or really social roles, of pediatricians and perhaps of doctors generally. And that's where we're going to get into political philosophy. So when parents refuse to let a child be vaccinated, the pediatrician, let's call her Dr. Smith, might consider threatening to fire the family. Rick mentioned this as one option. So what's involved here? Dr. Smith is considering imposing pressure on the parents. It might be inconvenient or costly for them to switch doctors, so the threat might induce them to permit vaccination. And if they still refuse, and Dr. Smith does fire the family, that might show other parents the cost of refusing vaccination, and so might induce them to permit their children to be vaccinated. But why might Dr. Smith think it appropriate to impose this kind of pressure? Presumably, there's some harm at stake that she hopes to avert. Most obviously, there's the harm to the child himself. Let's call him Jack. In the absence of a vaccination for disease D, philosophers love letters, Jack might contract D and suffer harm from it. Depending on the disease, the risk is going to vary. That, might, that fact might go into Dr. Smith's judgment as to whether to pressure the parents. But my interest here is in Dr. Smith's role. Here, she is simply her patient's advocate. Here, her focus is on the best interest of this child, Jack. Dr. Smith pressures the parents, the harm she's trying to avert is harm to Jack. Still, another harm is possible. Even if Jack doesn't contract disease D, perhaps without a vaccination, he'll become a carrier. He might infect someone else, say Jill. Jill might be unvaccinated, or she might be among those who are vaccinated yet remain vulnerable to the disease. Either way, by hypothesis, it's Jack who's been a cause of harm to Jill, a harm that would have been averted by hypothesis had Jack been vaccinated. Even uh, now, when Dr. Smith thinks about pressuring Jack's parents, her focus is not only on Jack, but also on averting harm to Jill. Now, is averting that harm included in Dr. Smith's professional brief? Jill's not her patient. Still, Jill comes in direct harm, direct contact with one of Dr. Smith's patients, and that contact is, by hypothesis, what harms her. If Dr. Smith has a way to get Jack's parents to permit vaccination, um, she will keep Jill from contracting the disease. So is Dr. Smith acting properly as a pediatrician if, when thinking about how to handle Jack's parents, she takes into account the risk that Jack poses to Jill? I suspect she is. I suspect most of us think that averting such a third-party harm is, in fact, part of Dr. Smith's professional brief. Now, no doubt threatening to fire Jack's family might not be an effective way to avert harm either to Jack or to Jill. I think what Rick suggested as a middle ground is probably sensible. Um, and in, uh, in any given case, there may be other morally relevant variables. The point is that Dr. Smith seems to have a professional responsibility beyond caring for Jack. So now let's, remove, let's move on to our last class of harm. This is the most interesting because in one sense there is no harm. Let's stipulate that on the following about disease D. Allowing Jack not to be vaccinated poses negligible harm, Jack to Jill, to anyone. Let's stipulate that at this point there's sufficient herd immunity with respect to D that merely having one or a few people unvaccinated is in terms of infection risk and irrelevance. Of course, this condition only obtains because almost every child but Jack has been vaccinated. Not vaccinating Jack is safe as long as the vast majority of children continues to be vaccinated. We thus have a classic free rider situation. On the stipulated premises, there's no problem with letting Jack go unvaccinated, but there would be a major problem in allowing many parents to act like Jack's parents and refuse vaccination. Then many children might come down with the disease. 
So here the harm that Dr. Smith might, might worry about is both dire and utterly notional. She's worried that if she cannot get Jack's parents to permit vaccination and many other pediatricians cannot get their patients' families to do so, there will be a pediatric public health problem. However, as a causal matter, nothing Dr. Smith does will have any impact on anything except whether Jack himself is vaccinated. The public health outcome will, the, the, the worrisome public health outcome will obtain only if enough other pediatricians fail with enough other parents. And nothing Dr. Smith does with regard to Jack, whether she manages to get him vaccinated or not, will have a causal impact on that issue. So this is a collective, a classic collective action problem. How Dr. Smith believes she should respond depends on the social role she believes she occupies. If her role as a pediatrician is only to look out for the health of her patient, of Jack, I see no reason why she should consider firing this family. On the stipulated premises, the failure to vaccinate Jack will have no repercussions for others, and so even the slightest risk to Jack, frankly, even inconvenience to Jack, ought to be a sufficient reason not to vaccinate Jack. On these premises, Dr. Smith should absolutely acquiesce in Jack's not being vaccinated. Dr. Smith has reason to consider putting pressure on Jack's family only if she sees herself as playing some medical role in addition to that of Jack's pediatrician. Let's return briefly to Jill. Dr. Smith's obligation to avert harm to Jill might have several sources. I do think it's part of her professional brief, but it might also be thought to follow from a general duty we all have to try to prevent harm to identifiable others. By hypothesis, in the scenario with Jill, there's a risk from Jack to a more or less identifiable other, and perhaps anyone, doctor or whomever, has the appropriate, if they have the appropriate causal lever at hand, here it might be pressuring the parents, has a duty to act to avert that harm. But when we return to our collective action problem, the only source left for a moral obligation seems to be Dr. Smith's professional role. So what is that role here? It seems to be that of someone who has a duty to promote the public health. That would explain why Dr. Smith has a reason to try to solve the collective action problem. If she and other pediatricians believe they have a public health duty to prevent outbreaks of disease D, Dr. Smith, Smith will think it part of that duty to find a way to induce Jack's parents to have him vaccinated. Again, whether this is a prudent move, an effective move, is not the issue. An issue is the fact that if Dr. Smith is considering it at all, it means she's considering it because she thinks that she has, in addition to the role of being Jack's pediatrician, another professional duty, that part of her role as a physician is to be a kind of public health official. Now, I take it that it's no surprise to any of you that doctors wear multiple hats. I've used the vaccination example, but I'm sure you can find many other examples, say, when a doctor decides not to offer tests that are collectively wasteful, although for her patients it might be a very small, but not a zero possibility, that they'll be useful. I'm not telling you, I think, anything you don't already know. Um, and you also know that there could sometimes be a conflict between the two hats that a doctor wears. What I do want to press is that this is a conflict that's internal to the practice of modern medicine. So it differs fundamentally from other two-hat situations. Physicians who work in the military or in a prison system wear two hats, but one's external to medicine. When there's a conflict, it's between one's duty qua physician and one's duty, say, qua military officer or prison official. That's very different from Dr. Smith's dilemma. Both of the hats that she wears are medical hats, and they're very specific to her professional role. I might run a grocery store and happen to care about public health, and I might be so into public health that I decide I won't sell anything to Jack's parents unless they get Jack vaccinated. Um, doing so seems external to what it is to be a grocery store owner. The point is here is that it's internal to what it is to be a physician. Now, if you wear two hats, your duties might conflict. And this is something that philosophers like. We love conflicts of duty because then we get to be ingenious and we get to try to figure out ways to resolve the conflicts. We invoke the principle of utility or we propose ingenious readings of the categorical imperative that handle such conflicts. That's not what I'm going to do. Um, of course, I could say that Dr. Smith shouldn't put too much pressure on the family. And I should say that if the vaccination poses some risk to Jack, it shouldn't be too much risk. Um, that is, I can recommend that Dr. Smith be a person of Aristotelian practical wisdom and that she see precisely where to hit the mark in every case. Um, but I'm not actually going to be able to help her. Instead, what I want to talk about is this. 
When Dr. Smith wonders whether it would be appropriate to fire Jack's family, she's functioning as someone with delegated public power and authority. She's considering withholding a valuable service for which she and a limited set of other individuals are licensed by the state, and she's considering doing so in order to promote what she takes to be a significant public good. She's acting both on behalf of the public and for the public. That Dr. Smith is doing so means that she becomes subject to certain moral constraints, namely those that apply to any wielder of state power in a pluralistic society, and that's where we finally get to political philosophy. Various issues could arise here. For instance, in determining the norms that should govern the physician in this special case, how much is determined by criteria that are conceptually embedded in the role of physician simplicator, such as, say, a general orientation toward maintaining health, and how much is determined by criteria that flow from society's view of its current needs and aspirations? And to seeing the physician's role in this special case as tied at least in part to socially constructed standards show that such standards also determine at least in part the physician's role simplicity. An important question. Maybe we can talk about it and related questions in the Q&A. I want to put it aside here in order to focus on something more manageable within the few minutes that I have left. Um, what I take to be at issue with Dr. Smith are the conditions for the exercise of state delegated power to be morally legitimate. Ours is a society with diverse beliefs, and when someone uses our collective power, the reasons that she invokes to justify such use ought to be consistent with the fact, with the fact of that diversity. The specific point is that when Dr. Smith takes on the role of public health official, certain constraints on the reasons she may consider come into play. I'm going to mention one way to specify these constraints. I find it persuasive, but I'm more concerned with the general issue than with um, per, um, uh, insisting that the way I propose is the best way to deal with it. The way that I'm going to mention comes from the work of the political philosopher John Rawls. Rawls' thought is that the exercise of state power must be in accordance with ideals and norms that all reasonable citizens could reasonably be expected to accept as a basis for using their collective power. The underlying idea is that when public officials consider how best to use the state's power, it's illegitimate to appeal to religious reasons or to controversial philosophical or other comprehensive reasons, as Rawls calls them. When state's power is exercised, it must be possible for those who are subject to it to see its exercise as reasonable, specifically as something they could come to accept without having to change, say, their own religious views. For instance, it would presumably be absurd to say to a Muslim that he would see that it's reasonable to tax him to support Christian churches if he'd simply convert to Christianity and see things from a Christian perspective. The reasons role says that are appropriate to justify the use of state power in a diverse society are what he calls public reasons. This can get complicated. They need not be reasons that don't involve reference to a deity. So Rick's idea of talking about um, all of us being born in God's image might actually count as public reasons taken in a particular way, and I can go on about this in the Q&A if you like. But what I want to point out that if you accept this constraint on the kinds of reasons public officials may invoke, then when Dr. Smith is deliberating about what to do about Jack, it would be wrong for her to take into account her own religious or other philosophical reasons, beliefs as a reason either for or against a proposed action with regard to Jack's family. She ought not, as a wielder of delegated state power, to be acting by reference to reasons that could not count as public reasons. She should see herself as acting on behalf of the larger society. Suppose that Jack's parents' objection to vaccination is religiously based. It doesn't matter whether Dr. Smith accepts or rejects that belief. The issue as a whole should be put out of play when she's acting as a public health official. Now, there are many questions about the proper role of religion or more generally of the health care worker's conscience in medicine. Uh, Pinocchio is told, always let your conscience be your guide. Uh, my claim is that when the doctor's role is that of public health official, that might actually be problematic, or rather that she should distinguish between her individual con conscience and, you might say, her public conscience. Um, the idea that physicians should see themselves as having special obligations to their fellow citizens as, I mean, again, this is in some ways not at all a new thing to say, but I think it's often been put in terms that are somewhat different, in terms, say, of a contract that physicians agree to when they accept the benefits of a state-enforced monopoly on medical care. I'm avoiding this route because it has difficulty handling the details that give a contract its moral force, namely explaining such things as when the alleged contract was really made 
how far its terms were really knowable at the time it was made, and so forth. I'm invoking something else, the conditions of moral legitimacy for the exercise of large and very important state delegated power. This is a role-related obligation. Whether you agreed to it when you took on the role isn't the issue. It would apply to you in that role even if somehow you'd been compelled to accept the role. The obligation stems not from a commitment but from a status. So I'm going to close with a question and a remark. Um, I've said that when, here's the question, I've said that when Dr. Smith is concerned with the collective action problem, she's acting both for the public and on behalf of the public, and that these conjo conditions jointly make her akin to a public servant and so subject to the moral constraints of that role. A question this analysis prompts is whether these moral constraints also apply when one of these mentioned conditions does not obtain, when Dr. Smith's focus is not the well-being of the public but the well-being of an individual patient, say, of Jack. Is she then not acting at all as public servant? Or does her public health role reveal something about the nature of the doctor's role? It's implicator. That's the question. Final remark is just this. And here I want to great stress on this. I am talking of Dr. Smith's moral obligation. I don't recommend turning these constraints on the kinds of reasons she may consider into legal obligations. Such constraints are moral, not legal obligations for other wielders of our collective power. There's no reason to see this differently for physicians. Would it make sense for medical organizations, professional organizations, to articulate and affirm the constraints that I've discussed? I don't know. Perhaps. In any event, that's certainly different from using the blunt instrument of the law. In any event, the question of how to make effective the moral constraints on the kinds of reasons to which doctors may appeal, at least in one of their roles, is a different issue than that of recognizing that adherence to such constraints is, in fact, a moral obligation associated with our Dr. Smith's public health role. Thank you.